has in store for us today. I'm going to get this back just a tiny bit here. So, you know, when I was in high school, we got to be where we were, we thought we were connoisseurs of fast food restaurants because that's where we always went all the time. You know, it was Whataburger, McDonald's, and Jack in the Box and all that stuff. When you're cruising the DeSoto Strip, of course, back in the days, 1981, right? Yeah, don't act like you weren't there. I saw you. So, <clears throat> you know, we measured everything, of course. The burger that each place had, the french fries that each place had is important. And then the drinks, the soft drinks, and the straws. The straws are important, you know, because the straw affects how much liquid you get and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, today you go to some fast food restaurants that even give you what to me back in the day was the thing that you got if you are at a hospital. That, you know, that right there. But you can get these just at fast food restaurants today. So, you know, great little functional piece. Uh, that's nice, I guess. It's not like it's hard to get from here to there. I got, you know, I don't, I don't need that necessarily. I can do that myself, but whatever. Uh, but the capacity of this is really small. Have you ever noticed that these straws are kind of small? So it's kind of funny in the last, um, last several years, they've come up with some new straws that you can buy in the store and you find larger straws at places like, um, have you been to these bubble tea places? It's kind of weird in and of itself. I'm not a fan of the bubble tea, but what they do give you, it's tea with like these little bubbles in it. And I don't mean like air bubbles. I mean like there are these little rubbery bubbles that you, you sip up and they go into your mouth and it's just weird. I don't like it. And then it dissolves and you kind of chew it, but it's not really chewy, but it is. And it's just weird. So they give you these massive straws here at these bubble tea places. You can also get these sometimes at milkshake places. And man, that's a lot. That's a lot of straw. I mean, you don't need a lot of time in the cup when you got this kind of straw. It's like, woo, mouthful done. Because there's a lot happening there. There's a lot of difference between this and this, right? And the difference is not the activity of the two. The difference is the capacity. Ah, oh, hey, look at that. Way to go. Capacity is different. Now, you know, recently we got, had a party at our house and we got some straws at like the dollar store or whatever. And there's these silver straws. Like, wow, that's awesome. But the thing is about this little silver straw is it's actually made of paper. And so once it's in your cup for a little while, it begins to dissolve and get all kind of crumbly on the inside. And the capacity is really small. So it's very ineffective. Looks pretty, but not much capacity. A lot of like Christians today in churches. Look pretty, not a lot of capacity. Hello. So I am excited because I think God is doing a work here. He is taking us from just trying to be pretty with little capacity, to even kind of being bold if we need to be with a lot more capacity. But I'm convinced that this is really not the end of where God wants us to get. He has a much greater capacity that he really wants us to get to that probably should look a lot more like this right here. Hello, you know, I mean, really, there ought to be a whole lot more coming down the pipeline into our life and out of our life. And really, this is a great comparison to straws, but I'm imagining that what God wants is even bigger than that. So that the capacity, our ability to receive all that he has is just flooding into us without any resistance, with full willingness to accept whatever he has to say, not debate it, not doubt it, not dismiss it, not try to deny it, but accept it and walk in it. Amen? That is what I believe God is doing in this series we're calling more, learning to expand your capacity for knowing God. Now, Jesus, I believe, taught this same truth, obviously, or we wouldn't be teaching it here. So in the Gospel of John, chapter 7, uh, Jesus said, He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now, if you are reading in a King James this morning, instead of the word heart, it has the very awkward word belly. Because when I think about things flowing out of my belly like a river, it's not a pleasant picture, <laughs> right? <clears throat> That's not where I want to be. But though the King James called it belly, 
Jesus was actually talking about something far more central to who we are. He was talking about the cavity within us. Your stomach is a cavity, but he was talking about the capacity and the cavity of your spirit and your soul to receive all that he has and then out of that for rivers of living water to flow so that our lives become a massive conduit for life to just flow out of us. This word flowing rivers here, it really is. It's a word for a torrent. It's a word for just massive waves of water. It's not the Ovilla Creek down here in summer, you know, August 12th, you know. Uh, it's a massive rushing water fall and overflow of what God is doing in us and flowing out of us so that you and I become passionate followers of Christ with life coming from us so that we walk into a room. The room lights up because we just stepped into it. Really, I'm serious. You don't believe me. Uh, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. When you step up into that room, that place, your family, because of the life that's in us, we bring life to the party. We bring truth to the scene. We bring hope and joy into the moment. I hope your family doesn't look at you when you come into the room and think, oh boy, here comes the one that sucks the life out of the room. I've known some Christians like that. They come in just, how's it going? Oh, it's just been a rough, my life is terrible, you yeah. know. God's going to get us all, and oh, it's just terrible, you know. Everybody's doomed, and we're doomed, and we're never going to get anywhere, and you might as well just run for the hills. Everybody's terrible. I hope that's not you. I hope you're not the one sucking the life out of the room and sucking the life out of the world. I hope you're the light giver because that's what Jesus has called us to be. Amen? Amen. We're to have rivers, rivers, plural, of living water flowing from us. Rivers of passion, rivers of desire, rivers of the spirit of truth, of hope and life, all flowing from us. Now, John's writing this passage here for us. And in case we need a little commentary, John gives us a little bit of commentary. Here's what John says next. But he spoke this concerning the spirit. Wow, interesting. Jesus saying that the one who believes in him will have rivers of living water flowing from him. And what he was talking about was the spirit being in us and flowing through us. Amen. As we've been talking about here for several weeks, that God has made us as spirit, soul, and body. And we are to be born again because we in our spirit are dead apart from Christ. Amen. In our sin, we are dead and separated and incapable of knowing God. But when the Spirit speaks to us and gives us his word and we respond to that grace by faith alone, you and I are saved. We are redeemed. We are given a new heart. His Spirit comes to live in our spirit and it begins to transform my mind my emotions, and my will to walk in his ways. And so you and I are in this process right now where I am seated with him in heavenly places. I am secure. Nothing can snatch me out of his hand. My spirit is safe with him. But that soul part of me, that natural part of me, my own mind, will, and emotions, they are in the process of being conformed and transformed to the very image of God. I'm having my thoughts renewed I'm having my emotions conformed. I'm having my will brought into subjection to Christ. This is the work that's happening, and we keep it in that order, the spirit alive in us. Amen? And that spirit is alive today. The spirit of God, if you are a believer. In fact, let me just make this clear from this point forward. I am talking this morning to believers who have put their faith in Jesus Christ, you've already confessed your sin, he's already forgiven your sin, you belong to him, you're secure in him. 
if you are not in that position today, please keep listening. But know this, all that I'm going to present from Scripture today is about the blessings that are ours in Jesus Christ once you have already entered into him. Amen? We'll come back to that. But if you are a child of God, the Spirit of God is in you. That flowing torrent of force and energy and power and truth is in you. And he is speaking. He is moving. He is pulsing. He is driving. He is giving hope, giving truth. He's moving through you, wanting to move you forward. He is transforming, conforming, moving you, showing you truth, showing you the glory of Jesus, showing you the Father. He's teaching. He's doing all of those things, and he's waiting for us to respond to him. Now, sadly, most Christians are far more familiar with the urges of their flesh than they are the urges of the Spirit. But we're about to bring an end to that today. My goal today is to help us leave here today so clear with what the Spirit is doing inside of you as a child of God that you leave this place with a greater sense of power, freedom, hope, joy, and authentic love for others than you've ever had before so that rivers truly are flowing through you and from you. Amen? Are you in for that? Yeah, I am too. So our message today is called, You Were Made to Be Led by the Spirit of God. To be led. To be driven from the inside. Not whipped into place from the backside, but led into truth from the inside. Those are two very different things. To be forced from the outside and to be driven from the inside. Amen? Those are different. So here's what Romans chapter 8 says, reference to our title today. It says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So like I said before, what I'm saying today is to people who are clearly people of faith, people who are redeemed, born again, and put their faith in Christ. You are a son of God, and you were designed to be led from the inside by the Spirit of God. As a son of God, as a daughter of the King, you were meant to to be led from the inside. Now, Galatians chapter five is where we're gonna spend a little bit of time today. So go ahead and turn your Bibles to Galatians five. You can follow along there in the New Testament, uh, a letter written by the apostle Paul to a church who was struggling with this whole idea of what it meant to be led by the spirit on the inside. They were very, very familiar with their flesh They were very, very familiar with the wicked desires that they had. They were very familiar with the culture around them that was pushing them into all kinds of immorality and and wickedness. And Paul writes to help them know how to be free on the inside. So I'm going to look at a couple different verses today. We'll do some work on the board here, and you can follow along, um, follow me, and take notes. You're welcome to take pictures of the board along the way. Uh, I'm going to leave it up here afterwards. If you want to come take pictures then, that's totally fine too. So one of the ways that is, or one of the truths that's essential for us, if we're going to be people who are led by the Spirit, then we have to know what we have been made in Jesus Christ. You have to know who you are. You have to know who this spirit is inside you and what your new position now is with God. So one of the things that Paul says in Galatians 5 is this from verse 18. He says, if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now, let's break this down a little bit because first he says, led by the spirit, if you are led, if you are sensitive to and aware of the Holy Spirit within you, 
giving you urges and impulses. Uh, in church, we often use the word promptings. I'm okay with urges and impulses too. I know most people associate urges with uh, the flesh. But the Spirit of God has urges within us, amen? And impulses and pulsings. He's wanting to take us somewhere to lead us, and he does it through urges and impulses and promptings and motivations and desires within us. But you and I don't always recognize them. We dismiss them. We count them as something else. But we're very, very in tune to our own fleshly appetites and urges, aren't we? Have you ever had this conversation with your spouse or some friends? Hey, where do you want to go eat today? You're like, oh man, I'm really feeling some Mexican food today. Isn't it funny? It's not just an urge to eat, but we know exactly what kind of food we want to eat. You're like, oh man, I could really feel some Mexican food, like some tacos, like man, it would really be, hey, you know that place where this got some good chips at that place. Let's go there and the case that's really awesome. Isn't it funny how specific we get with all that stuff? We know our urges when it comes to the flesh. Or some, you know, someone says to you, hey, what do you want to do tonight? Um, you know, I was thinking about, um, you know, let's go out. I mean, I was really thinking about going bowling tonight. You had not been bowling a long time. It's kind of cool. We're that in touch with just our natural urges and appetites. Like, hey, that would be cool to do. But how familiar are you with the spirit of God within you? And he starts speaking. Can you say, yes, I sense you, spirit of God. And I sense exactly what you are wanting to do. This is what you and I are called to. So uh, it's okay if at this point right now you're feeling a little awkward because you say, I'm not sure I've got that level of uh, closeness, awareness with the Spirit of God urging and pulsing within me. That's okay. We're here to learn that this morning, amen? All right, so let's just put yourself in a place to learn and take in some things today because I believe the Spirit of God is speaking. But to be led by the Spirit, Paul says, you've got to be in a place where you are not under the law. Now, he's not talking about the local police hanging out on the street. He's not saying you have to be free from that law. No, you should be under that law that says drive this speed limit and drive in this way. You should be under that law. But Paul was saying, because he understood this and knew this as a man who had grown up as a Jew and a Pharisee, he knew for him that the law dominated his life. The law that defined here is what righteousness is and here's what perfection is. The law that said here is the way, walk in it, and if you don't, there's condemnation for you. The law that said it is perfect, it is exacting, and it tells you exactly what to do. The law that said measure up if you wanna be blessed. And Paul said, you know, I'd found out. He said, I couldn't do that. But I also found out that Jesus came and he kept the law perfectly for me. He died on the cross for me. He rose again for me and gave me his completed obedience. He gave me his ability to keep the law. He gave me the, the certificate that said, done. You did it, even though I had it. He gave me his righteousness. So Paul says, if you want to have a leading of the Holy Spirit in your life, you've got to get to the place where you recognize, listen to me, that you recognize now as a child of God that you are no longer under condemnation. If you set under the law, it is a weight that tells you Failure, loser, can't measure up. Let's put some words on the screen that I think will help us here because people that live under the law, so I want you to picture this as like a big, a big weight that's coming down. And boy, it is heavy and it is hard. People who live under the, the law, they tend to live rule-based. Now, I like rules and guidelines. I like for everybody to play by the rules. If we're going to play a game at home, guess who reads the rules? It's me. But when it comes to walking with Christ, he says, look, you didn't get salvation because you kept the rules perfectly. In fact, you couldn't. So he did. And he said, now 
you are free from having to live under the weight of never being good enough. Amen? Romans 8, 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You don't have to live under this idea that Christianity is this heavy, long list of rules. But boy, a lot of Christians do. They think that's what Christianity is, is somehow getting this manual full of hard to keep, hard to bear rules. And that most of the time, if not all the time, I can never, ever get there with them. And so faith is hard. Getting up and reading my Bible is difficult. Spending time with church people is a beating. <laughs> right? That's how people feel because some people live under the weight of the rule-oriented, rule-based life. It also looks like this. They are sin conscious. I'm going to show you some verses here in a little bit, but Jesus came to free you from the weight of guilt of your sin. You don't have to keep carrying that weight around. You weren't meant to keep bearing that burden. That is why he came to set the captives free so that you don't have to carry around what you did in 2011, in 2019, and in 1992 or further back. You don't have to carry that weight anymore. You don't have to live conscious all the time of your past and you don't even have to live conscious all the time now of your sin. But this is what many Christians do. They're far more aware of their sin than they are of Christ's righteousness. They're far more aware of every place they failed than every place he succeeded. They're far more aware of all their weaknesses than they are of his strengths. And they live in that. And so they live, I'm just a wretched sinner. Oh, I'm just glad to be a child of God because I'm so wretched and miserable. I'm just terrible all the time. I can't do anything right. That's a new voice, isn't it? So I don't know where that came from. But that's a lot of Christians live like that under this heavy rule base conscious of their sin all the time. Oh, I got to keep up with my list of sins so I can make sure I confess them. I got to make sure I keep up with all this because, oh boy, oh boy, God's going to be upset with me. Oh my goodness, I just, I just, I never can. Hey, what a miserable way to live. There's no joy in that. There's no good news in it. There's no gospel in that. There's heaviness and despair and sorrow in that. And there's also... When this is who you are with yourself, this is who you are with other people. This is all you think about is what everybody else has done wrong. You're sin conscious of yourself. You're sin conscious of your family. You're sin conscious of your spouse. You're sin conscious about your kids. And that's all you focus on is what everybody else has done wrong because that's what you're focused on is sin all the time. Yours and everybody else's. And that will make you a slave. Hello? The other thing that living under the law does is it gives you a fear of disappointing God. Look, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, the Bible said you were made accepted in the beloved. You were brought right up into the Trinity. You were brought right up into the Son, and you were seated next to the Father, perfectly accepted. He even called you blameless. Why would we dare insult him by living 
as though I could take one step and totally ah, fall out of favor with God. Yet this is where so many Christians live. They live in this tightrope thing of, boy, I just, mm, I got to pray hard this week because, boy, you know, I take the wrong step. This whole thing just goes down the tubes as though there's uncertainty and insecurities and fear and tor torment upon them and heaviness. And there's no, there's no joy in anybody like that. There's only fear in someone like that. There's anxiety in someone like that. There's depression in someone like that. There's a need to rush off and try to find something that'll make me feel better. I need to drink something, eat something, go somewhere, get with somebody, do something to make me feel better because this weight is absolutely crushing me. Can anybody identify? You know what I'm talking about? And boy, this is where so many people live. They live with guilt just crushing down on them daily. They're so afraid they're going to mess up and cause God to turn away. They're so afraid they're going to take a wrong step, say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing. You'll never find the right thing by fearing the possibility of the wrong thing. You'll never discover what God's will is for your life by always fearing you're going to do the wrong thing with your life. You'll find the will of God for your life when you surrender your heart to the right thing that God has done for you. Amen. I'm going to stop asking for amens today because I know this is hitting real close to home for all of us. Hello? I have been here I'm talking to you about this because I have walked in this. I spent years of my Christian life in this. And it depressed me. It frustrated me. And it, it almost angers me now to know today that the enemy is still whipping people into this place today. This makes people see the Christian life as just pure drudgery. It's just miserable. It's just ah. reading the Bible, terrible. Praying, painful. Church, bear it. Talk to someone about my faith, never. Admit that I'm a Christian out in public, no chance. Giving a tithe, eh. Worshiping freely, not feeling it. This is where the enemy has convinced the church that they are to live today. And it's a lie from him. It's a deception from him. You were not meant to live with the weight of sin upon your back. Amen. What it turns into is a, a forced obligation. Well, I have to do these things. I have to pray. I have to read my Bible. I have to go to church. If I don't, oh, lightning might strike me. Really? That's your view of God? That you take one step off the path and lightning comes from heaven to destroy you? Really? You're that settled in his love that you think that is what's going to happen? That is a lie from the enemy. Forced obligation. God is not whipping you from behind to get you to go somewhere. God is driving you on the inside from his spirit, urging and leading you to all that he has for you. If you're feeling a whip on your back, it's from the enemy and not our Savior. Because he took the whip on, your, on his back so you never have to feel it on your back. I'm just going to go ahead and get on into some more awkward stuff. Because this just applies right on over into marital intimacy. 
It's okay that you got real quiet on this. Let me talk to the men for a little bit. Men, husbands. You've been made one with your wife. That's what the Bible says that marriage is. And our role as men, as husbands, is to lead like Christ leads and loves the church. He does not lead by standing behind to insult, condemn, force anything. He leads from the inside by his sacrifice and service to us. Amen? So husbands, do not ever force your wife into intimacy that is physical. I hope you hear me. That is not what a godly, Christ-honoring husband does. And if your wife has lost her desire, do not ask her to fake it till she makes it. Find out what has happened to the emotional and spiritual intimacy that is supposed to be in place before there's ever any kind of physical intimacy in place. And when you restore what has been missing emotionally and spiritually, you'll find a return of desire even for physical intimacy. So, when this is how you live in relation to God, when this is how you relate to others, even when it comes to the Bible, even when it comes to church, and you live under rule-based, sin-conscious, fear of disappointment, conflict, here is what you get. You say, I can't even see what that says. Camera can zoom up and show you what it says. It says desire. And you say, well, why did you write it so small? Because this only produces a tiny bit of true desire. When you live under have to, you will rarely ever want to. If you believe this Christian life that you're walking in is somehow this drudgery list of rules, by the way, that's what religion brings to you, and I won't list denominations, but there's plenty of them out there who are more rule-based than Christ-based. What you get out of them is people who function in a rule-based environment and try their best to keep the rules while they're in the environment, but as soon as they're out of the environment, they live like hell out there because their desire is about that small or smaller to follow what Christ says. Are you with me? This is not spirit-led. This is not at all what God's design is for you and me. If this is you, it's time for some serious thought processes this morning and heart dealings with where you are. Because what I want to talk to you about today is really what it means to be spirit-led. I want to unpack for you what the Bible says about the Spirit's urges inside. All right? So I'm going to move a little bit faster on this because we got so much more to do. Let me show you some verses and we're going to jump into this. 
Let's go to um, let's go to Hebrews eight. This relationship that you and I are now in with God says this. Uh, the Bible says, "For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness." And their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. That's Hebrews 8, 12. Then Hebrews 10, 26, it refers to us and says, if there had been a sacrifice given that could truly set the people free, free, here's what it would be. For the worshipers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sins. You and I were called to live a life where we are no more living like this. Always obsessed with, overwhelmed with, consumed with our sin, the guilt, the fear, the shame. Let me move on. Let me talk to you about the urges and pulses of the Spirit of God. Are you with me this morning so far? We're talking about some heavy stuff. I don't want us to talk about anything at vertical that doesn't have life relevance to it, amen? That didn't truth into here to be lived out there, to lift him up and live him out. So here is what the Bible says about the urges and the pulses of the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is within you. And so what his desire is, is to lead you to all that Christ has for you. So here's one of the things that the Spirit urges within you. Number one, to walk in truth. The Spirit of God will always lead you into truth. When I hear someone say, well, I just have this sense that maybe I'm supposed to do this thing. And whatever that thing is, sometimes people will tell me what that thing is. And if that thing is counter to what God says in his word, I can tell you right away that is not from the spirit of God. Because God always pulses within us for us to walk in truth. So let me show you this verse. Uh, from John 16, Jesus said, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. Yeah, can we get that verse on the screen? There we go. The spirit, one of the things he does is he guides you, he leads you into all truth. Sadly, if you ask many Christians and say, hey, what's the purpose of the spirit of God in your life? Here is the honest to God answer that a lot of Christians will say. Well, the Holy Spirit's role is to convict us of sin. You want to check that verse? You go back and look at what Jesus actually said. Stay with me. Jesus said, when he, the Spirit, comes, he will convict the world of sin, but he will lead his own into truth. There's a big difference between confronting and convicting of sin and leading somebody into truth. If you have not yet come to Christ, the Spirit of God is speaking in you today and he is pointing out your sin. Just boom, boom. He's relentless like that. But if you've come to Christ already, he's going to lead you into truth and you'll become aware of your sin. Those are very, very different The Spirit is not the one in you that keeps poking you in the eye about what you did last week. The Spirit is not the one in you that keeps poking you about your past. That's another voice that you need to shut down quickly. He is the antagonizer of the brethren, the accuser of the brethren. He is the enemy himself who keeps poking you about your sin that has been taken care of on the cross. The Spirit is the one in you who is leading you into all truth. And so when he speaks, it will be for you to walk in truth. That is why spending time in the Bible is so critical because the Spirit of God within you and the Word of God in front of you will help you know God's direction for what's in front of you. Number two, the Spirit of God is calling you to change. The Spirit of God is alive. He is moving. He is pulsing. He is, he is 
a current that's powerful within you. Second Corinthians says that we're being transformed into the same image of Jesus from glory to glory. We've looked at this verse just as by the spirit of the Lord. The spirit of the Lord is calling you to change. He's not calling you to get stuck in your ways and stay the same and never be any different. He's calling you to transformation. He's calling you to look more like Jesus. He's calling you to change your attitude, change your heart, change your mind, change your emotions. Keep growing. Be different. This is the Spirit of God within you. Don't resist that voice when he's calling you to change. This is the Spirit of God. Number three, the Spirit within you is calling you to come alive. What's a funny thing about people in church especially? Get together here and people are like, oh my goodness, I just almost felt like dancing, but I can't because it's church, you know. <laughs> really, who told you that? Was there, is there a rule posted somewhere that I hadn't seen yet? What? You mean to come into the place where the people of God who claim to worship the Father because of what the Son did and the Spirit alive within them, you're telling me that in that place we're to be the most stiff, reserved, boring people we ever are at any other time in our life? Really? Is that what you believe? Who told you that? Who told you that you could go home and shop for your favorite sports team, but you get in here and you got to stick a sock in your mouth? Who told you that? Who told you all that? Who told you can get out and have fun in your backyard with your friends and do all kind of crazy stuff, but the minute you get in here, you got to turn into a fence post? Who told you that? That was not the Spirit of God that told you that. That was another spirit that told you that. And I'm trying to shut his voice up today. Amen? I'm here to illuminate what the Spirit of God is saying within us. Look, when we gather together, the people of God gather together, the redeemed people together are gathered together, the ones who know truth are gathered together, the ones who have the Spirit of God in us gathered together, the ones who say where two or three are gathered in my name, there I will be. You're telling me that in that place we ought to be stoic and stiff? Wrong. Second Corinthians 3, now the Lord is the Spirit and where the Spirit of the Lord is. There's liberty, there's freedom. There's no more bondage. There's no more anxiousness. There's no more fear of what this person's gonna think and what this person could say and oh, we're supposed to be Baptist or we're supposed to be Methodist or we're supposed to be whatever. No, we are people who have been set free by the Spirit of God, redeemed by Jesus. Come on and get some liberty up in your house, amen? Come on. Ooh. Number four, the Spirit is also urging us to love authentically, not fake, not pretending, genuine, authentic. The Scripture says that we're to be obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren. We, we do it, though, man. We, we like to call everybody else fake news. You go into a church on a Sunday morning, you, we all look like CNN. Hello? <laughs> How's it going, brother? Oh, good to see you. Praise God. Yeah. Who is that guy? I don't even know who that guy is. Irritating me. Hey, that's all fake news right there. Act in one way, the minute you cross that threshold to come in here and then you walk back out and you're going to be somebody else, stop all that. Don't be calling somebody else fake news when you're the fakest news around. We're called to live in sincere love. That means without fake, without pretension. We're not faking it till we make it. We're faithing it all the way to the end. Hello? With fervent love, passionate love from a pure heart. I'm chasing out all those impurities. I'm removing all that stuff that tells me to fake it. If you come in having a bad day, tell somebody you're having a bad day so they can gather around and pray for you. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. We don't need a room full of mannequins. You can get that in your department store today. That's not what we're here for. 
Woo. Let's go on number five. The Spirit is also pulsing, urging you to rest in Christ. Boy, it's, it could be tough sometimes to not rest in him, to get so caught up in all that's happening around us. But the scripture tells us that we have the spirit within us and he helps us in our weaknesses. For there's times we don't know how to pray as we ought. Anybody identify with that? But the spirit himself, he makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot even be uttered. Boy, there's sometimes I don't know what to pray. That's not the moment to pretend like you do. That's the moment for you to sit there and just groan and let the Spirit pray. And in that moment, know with confidence, I don't know what to say, but the Spirit does. And boy, he's praying for me right now. And I am going to rest in the fact that he is praying for me with even greater passion than I could even pray for myself. Amen? This is what the Spirit is urging within us. Number six, the Spirit is also urging us to never fear. The Bible says that God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and a sound mind. You know my story. You know I've struggled with this. You know I can walk in this quickly if I'm not careful. But that spirit within me and you is never going to be one that causes you to fear, to fear the outcome, to fear the next step, but instead to have a spirit that has power to it, has love with it, and has mental clarity, a spirit of love, power, and a sound mind, that verse says. Clarity. That's the spirit of God. So when you are in a situation and you feel this rush of emotion and you feel these racing thoughts, that's the moment where you stop and say, all right, those are not giving me Clarity, power, or love. They are giving me insecurity, uncertainty, and making me feel unloved. That you have to silence. Silence that voice. Dismiss that voice. Deny that voice. I don't care how much it rages in you emotionally. You tell it no. I will not listen to you because you are not from God. Amen? Number seven is to know you are washed. That you are forgiven. That you are free. Titus writes in chapter three and says, it's according to his mercy that he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Don't listen to the voice within you that plagues you with guilt and shame. That's not from God. The voice that's from God reminds you, I sent my son for you. He shed his blood for you. He offered it on the altar for you. And I have accepted it for you. And you are now clean. Amen. Listen to that voice. And then the final one. Well, next to the final one. The spirit inside says to you and I, if you are in Christ, you 
are not a disappointment to God. I can't tell you how many times this has come up in the last several weeks. How the enemy is using that to keep believers small because he keeps reminding them of their sin and keeps saying, you are such a disappointment to God. You were just made for more, but you fritted it away. You have such small faith. You just mess up all the time. I'm going to tell you again, that is not from God. The Spirit of Christ moves in and has this to say from Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. And then finally, the Spirit urges us to take action. It's a beautiful story in the book of Acts um, where you see the Holy Spirit moving in people's lives. There's a story of um, a man named Philip. And he's following after what God's called him to. And it says in uh, verse 9, It says, then the Spirit said to Philip, the Spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. There was a man in that chariot that needed to hear the gospel. And God had arranged it and ordained it. And he said to Philip, hey, you see that chariot? I want you to go over there. He didn't tell him all was going to be behind that point in that direction. But all Philip knew was, I got to get to that chariot. The Spirit of God will speak to you and say, I want you to go and I want you to talk to that person. I want you to pray for that person. I want you to give to this need. I want you to obey me and the Spirit will speak. And this is where Christians often say things like, well, I just don't know. I mean, you know, if I do that, it'd just be kind of awkward. I don't know what they would say if I did it, and I don't know how I'd feel if they did it, and I, you know, I just don't know. I mean, I just, is it the right thing to do? Is it not the right thing to do? I mean, there's so many questions. I just decided I'm not going to do it at all. Hello, right? That's what most Christians do. They just dismiss it because they can't figure it all out. You weren't meant to figure it all out. You were meant to just go on over to that chariot and do what God said. He'll work it all out. And you want to recognize that spirit within you? You want to hear him give you instruction like that? Well, then the next time he does it, you do what he says. Then you'll recognize it the next time. Because the person who learns to listen to all of this right here, the person who learns to walk in this, the person who will learn to walk in peace with God, the person who will learn to walk in forgiveness with God. The person who will learn to walk in the full acceptance that they have in Jesus Christ. There will be a noticeable thing about their life and here's what it will be. Like Paul in the New Testament said, do you see with which large letters I'm writing this? Do you see the difference between this and this? If you're living under the weight today of all of this, I already know what your desire level is like. You're beating yourself up to try to live this Christian life. But if you'll walk in who Jesus says you are, if you'll walk in the Spirit pulsing through you, your desire will be off the charts. You'll all of a sudden say, you know, I can't find enough I can't find enough time to read all the scripture that I want to read. I want to keep on reading. I want to keep on praying. I want to keep on serving. I want to be with God's people. I want to learn. I want to grow. I want to worship. I want to do all these call me to do. I want to change because desire will be alive within you. That's the difference. And I'm looking to see what God's going to do in a generation 
that will believe what he says and stop living under the weight of what the world and the enemy says and say, God, I will yield to you because I want to be led by the Spirit. I want to be led by you. I don't want to be led by my flesh. I don't want to be led by fear. I want to be led totally by you and have this come alive in me. Big, great, passionate desire. Those who do, they'll have rivers of living water flowing through them. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me? It might be that today you need to acknowledge that you've been living with small desire. You've been living under guilt. You've been living under fear. You've been living under the fear of disappointing God instead of being accepted in Christ. You've been thinking that it's all about keeping the rules instead of about Jesus having kept the rule. You're more caught up in your condemnation than you are in your acceptance. And today it's time to say, God, forgive me. Forgive me, God, for making it all about me instead of about you. For forgetting what you accomplished on the cross. For dismissing your spirit within. Today, Father, I will come alive in you. I will hear your spirit. Father, I will yield my life to you. Forgive me for making it so small, for being more in tune with my flesh than being in tune with the spirit. Today, I make a change. I repent of my old ways and now I'll walk in freedom in you. I'll walk in the joy of the Holy Spirit. I'll walk in the power of the Holy Spirit because I want, just as you said, for rivers of living water to flow through me. I want desire to come alive within me. I want to live and I thank you that you have made peace between us and you by the cross. Father, I thank you for what you're doing in us. We pray in Jesus' name.